an original work of art when it is printed by a hand-pulled method. It may be printed several times so many people can enjoy it. Also, prints are more affordable than paintings and they have a special unique personality and look that really appeals to me. Uh, that's why I'm a printmaker. I prefer the look of prints. This was a brochure for a very large printmaking exhibition, Traditional Techniques, Contemporary Prints, that I was part of last year in Woodland, California. I was thrilled that they used my woodcut, Likeness of Being, for the example of the relief process. There are four major areas of printmaking. Relief, intaglio, lithography, and serigraphy, more commonly known as silk screening. While I've done every form of printmaking, I am a relief printmaker now. If you made a linoleum print in junior high or a potato print in kindergarten, that is a form of relief printmaking. It is the same process I do, except I use wood. In relief, it is the surface of the printing matrix that prints. Whatever I cut away will not print. Lithography, on the other hand, is a planographic process. There are no high and low areas, only a smooth surface. Lithography works on the principle that oil and water will always repel one another. It's all chemistry and magic. I was a lithographer for 15 years and went to graduate school to become a better lithographer, but rediscovered the woodcut instead, and I've stuck with it now for 35 years. This is likeness of being 24 by 19 inches, and it's of a Florida heron and his reflection in the water. It was part of the emergence exhibition at the Puri Riverfront Museum in 2018, and selected for five national and one international jury print show. It's currently part of the Boston Printmakers Traveling Exhibition uh, that traveled all of last year, and it was going to be in Cuba this past April, but that exhibition has been postponed due to the pandemic. Here's a younger version of me at Bradley, getting ready to uh, print for the day. I'm... <coughs> arranging my colored inks on the ink slab for a blended roll with a large litho roller. And now I'm inking up the printing matrix, which in this case was a sheet of plexiglass. Now I'd like to go over the reduction woodcut process with this print, Kaibab. Kaibab is an aerial view of the Grand Canyon that I made shortly graduate school. And last year I had a one person show at the Decatur Area Arts Council in Decatur, Illinois. And it was their idea to exhibit one of my woodcuts and my printer's proofs uh, along with the rest of the exhibition. So here's the finished frame print, Kaibab, and below it is the printing matrix which is a quarter inch plywood. And this was the first run through the press. I cut a little bit of wood away. I don't know if you can see that, but those just ended up being highlights in the finished print. So this was a blended roll for the first run. And after I printed 20 of these, I was a lot younger then and I printed larger editions. Now I'm lucky to get 10. Uh, after I printed all 20 of these, I went back and cut away all the areas where I wanted these pretty colors to show up. Then I printed another blended roll on top, cut some more wood away, and then this was uh, the finished print, which was done with three runs through the press. Now we're in my Summit Boulevard studio where I printed for 10 years right after graduate school. Another view, a blended roll in the foreground with a little hand brayer here. Another view. And now I'm inking up an uncut piece of plywood. This is frequently how I start to work. I don't cut the wood, I just ink the wood. <laughs> So I've got my blended roll on my litho roller and I'm inking up an uncut piece of plywood. 
Then I'm adding more color with hand brayers, more color with another hand brayer. And now I'm carefully registering the paper to the block of wood. I have six registration marks on the back of the paper and six on the piece of wood. Uh, it's very important to have a registration system when you're working in color because I'm gonna run the same sheet of paper through the press many times over several weeks. So oh, here's my Dickerson combination press that I purchased shortly after getting my MFA at Bradley. And on the press bed, you see the printing matrix, the plywood, and here is the first run printed on paper. This is all background color. And after I print the whole edition, and I must decide on the first run how many I'm gonna make because I can't go back and make more later when I work reductively. Uh, after I print the whole edition, I will go back and cut away areas of the wood that I want to stay any of these pretty colors. And then seven runs and several weeks later, the finished image is Aladdin's tail. And this was the first time I used a Dremel tool, first and last time I used a Dremel tool to cut the wood. It was just too noisy for me, too much vibration. I didn't like it. I went back to my Japanese gouges. And here I am in my current high point studio. Uh, using a mylar stencil to ink up just the flesh tones on what will become my Buddhist monk. And this print took 21 runs through the press. I was a little crazy at that point. Most runs I ever put on one sheet of paper. This is Saba Nyu, tie for the enlightened one. Another view of my high point studio, my inking area. I turned a spare bedroom in my home into a very functional printmaking studio. Another view of my press. And my husband had the great idea of taking window screens and installing them inside my press stand to make drawing racks. And this has served me very well in a small space. This is the first run through the press, a blended roll for um, the print I'm going to show you next. This is the second run and the finished print is serendipity done in three runs. To see me printing two of the 15 runs for this print, Lovely Legs, you can go to YouTube and just type my name but be sure and spell my name right. My mother's spelling with a C and an IE and it'll pop right up. This is a very successful print uh, for me. This is Lovely Legs, 24 by 36. And it was inspired by 12 years of teaching water aerobics, which I still teach, although the pool I teach at is closed right now. But I love water aerobics. And I love teaching water aerobics. And this print ended up on the cover of Graphic Impressions, the newsletter of the Southern Graphic Council International, the summer of 2014. It also won the Works on Paper Award in a printmaking show at the Gales, or in a members exhibition at the Galesburg Civic Arts Center. In 1998, my husband's job with Caterpillar moved us overseas for six years. We were in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia for the first three and Grenoble, France for the last three. We traveled a lot during those six years and I saw many countries I had never dreamt of getting to see. This is Jamal al-Hikmah, Arabic for the beauty of wisdom. And it's of an old Bedouin woman who had facial tattoos. Uh, many people think it's a man with a beard, but no, these are facial tattoos. And I met this woman in Jordan and asked permission to photograph her. And this uh, print is in two important collections. It was uh, purchased by Dar Benzager's uh, 
Museum, where I taught studio art classes to Saudi women. And it's also at the International Print Center in New York City. And this is Sabin Yu. Uh, this was inspired by a trip to Thailand and an interest in Buddhism as well as contemporary theology. Uh, this is my kind of um, um, um well what was i going to say i forget <laughs> um oh east meets west there was a western uh, man in this doorway um uh, coming through doorway and this very frail small uh buddhist monk in the other doorway and I just snapped this picture and it was several years later before I turned it into a print, but um, that's what I was thinking about when I did that. L'Entre was inspired by a trip to southern Spain and it, its claim to fame is it was purchased by a Saudi prince. And I have a fi very funny story to tell about meeting Prince Charming, but I don't have time to tell it now. It was selected for a Bradley International Print and Drawing Exhibition while I was living overseas. And this is the view from my attic studio in France, our famous mountain peak, Le Trois Pucelles. So the title is Fenêtre sur les Trois Pucelles. And this was the first time I used two blocks of wood to uh, finish a print. <laughs> I just couldn't get it all out of one block. In 2012, I found out that the handmade Kozo paper that I had been printing on almost exclusively since graduate school was no longer available. I bought the last 35 sheets and then found about a dozen more on eBay. So now my paper is too precious to print on. So I go through my print drawers and I pull out every unfinished or rejected print and start a series of model prints. Mono prints are one of a kind, unique prints, no edition, printed from a printing matrix, in my case, a woodcut. Monotypes, on the other hand, have no printing matrix, and these are often mislabeled and confused. This is uh, part of the Pluvius series. Uh, I was taking a break from my figurative work, and I started these non-objective mono prints. And these were all printed from a single piece of wood in many stages. The Pluvia series started out as an addition I never really liked, so I started experimenting. First, I developed the staining technique to color the white areas of the print that always bothered me. And then I started reworking the block and printing more runs on top. This is Pluvius 1, it's 24 by 36. Pluvius Six received the Fine Art Print Award in Galex 52, the National Juried Exhibition at the Galesburg Civic Arts Center in 2018. I was rejected though the following year from the same exhibit. Uh, Deyanu, that's Hebrew for it would have been enough, contains the history of my printmaking for the previous 25 years. It started out as a piece of paper that I forgot to print on the second run of another print that I printed in graduate school. There are elements of all that I am as a printmaker, monotype shapes from the 90s, blocks from other editions, one of which is in this slideshow. Uh, can you guess which one? It was selected for the 2017 Bradley International and it was the sec, uh, the most recent print to get into the International Print Center's new prints show um, in autumn of 2014 and several other national exhibitions. So this was a very successful print for me. The Dianoia series includes three mono prints recycled from a mono print I did not like, so I literally tore it up. Dianoia 2, 15 by 25 inches, was the first time I collaged two pieces of paper together to create an image. And it was selected for four juried national shows in four states. So the 
uh, lesson there is never throw anything away. <laughs> Lisier means edge. This model print started out as part of the Pluvia series, but for the last runs are from the same block of wood as Day Anew, the mystery block. I'll give you a little hint. This other block of uh, wood was a vertical, started out as a vertical image. And Lisier was also selected for four national juried printmaking exhibitions in four states. So my non-objective uh, model prints led to my current direction of more non-objective edition prints. Surge is a woodcut 17 by 21 inches. It sold immediately in its first exhibition before the opening at the old print shop in New York City. Very unusual for me. Normally I have to age my prints in my print drawers for a year or two before one sells or gets into an important exhibition. This edition print is uh, breaking 24 by 36. I documented how I made this and every print after it on my website, run by run. I decided that it was a good record for me uh, and also a good teaching tool. And it's just so easy to photograph things with an iPhone and just stick them on the website the same day that you print them. So I continued to do this. And here's serendipity again, 19 by 24 inches. Uh, it had been about 19 years since I was able to complete a work of art in only three runs. So I was pretty proud of myself. And this print was also the beginning of a new direction that evolved from my non-objective mono prints. And this new direction I like to describe as the converging of line shape, color and texture in an ambiguous space with whispers of landscape. And then Sectrum is also 19 by 24 on Hosho paper, and it was completed in only two runs, even though I originally planned it as three. And I'm going to show you run by run how I did it. Started out with this beautiful blended roll on the litho roller. And here you see the plywood printing matrix in the foreground. I'd already cleaned up my ink, but this is the printed uh, blended roll on the paper. The ink's still on the litho roller. And the second run through the press was another blended roll. And here you see it rolled out on the ink slab. And here it is rolled out on the printing matrix. So after I cut some wood away, and then I got spectrum this is the finished image. But before I cleaned up, I got out those two first run prints that I forgot to print from the serendipity edition. Remember these? I think this is because they were on the left hand side of the press bed and I don't normally have prints over here. I just forgot to print them. I had two prints with just the first run and they didn't get the second run and then it was too late to go back and, and uh, print them again. So I started with this for my first run, then I added this blended roll on top with this wood cut, and I got two mono prints. The first mono print I called Inception, and then I didn't want to have two prints that were the same because then of course they wouldn't be mono prints. Uh, so I deliberately printed the second one upside down. Just figured, well, what do I have to lose? We'll see what happens. And the second print, Inception 2, was accepted into an important uh, monotype and monoprint workshop or exhibition in Rhode Island last year. This is homage to Hokusai, and it's only 12 by 16 inches. Hokusai is one of my favorite Japanese printmakers from the Ukiyaue masters of the 19th century Japan, who produced beautiful color woodcut prints that depicted the fleeting pleasures of everyday life. Ukiyaue means floating world of everyday life. Hokusai and Hiroshigi 
are my favorites and they created wonderful atmospheric effects in their landscapes and seascapes, which have definitely influenced my own work. Uh, this woodcut was part of the Society of American Graphic Artists 85th Members Print Exhibition at the Newark Public Library in Newark, New Jersey last uh, December, and now it's part of their special collections. Luna C, two words, was created for the Luna C, one word, uh, which was an invitational exhibition at McLean County Arts in Bloomington in 2018. It was also selected for an important printmaking exhibition in California called Sweet Earth, Bitter Earth in Los Angeles. And it was at the Peoria Riverfront Museum store for the Moon Exhibition, along with the following print, Numina. Numina was rejected from several jury shows last year. And then it went on to receive the Best of Show Award in the River Meets the Rail exhibition at the Galesburg Civic Arts Center in April of last year. The word noumena is the opposite of phenomena and it's currently in Indiana for a national printmaking exhibition that has been postponed till they can reopen. Now I'd like to talk about a new process that I've been learning about this past year. Remember I started out as a lithographer, but I made my last lithograph in 1986 in graduate school. I missed drawing on a stone with litho pencils and lithographic tush. So when I heard about the Mokalito process, I was intrigued. I was ready to try something new. After over 30 years of doing the same thing, so I watched several YouTube videos on the process and jumped in with both feet. I really didn't know what I was doing, but I'm very happy with the results. I started with this photo by Julie Dodge of me feeding Razzle Dazzle, who died in 2018. My koi are my only pets, and I'm crazy about them. With her permission, I used her lovely composition for my first mocolito, or lithography on wood. I drew on sanded birch plywood with a litho pencil and litho crayons, then etched it with gum arabic to strengthen the water-loving areas and grease-loving areas so the ink will only stick to the drawn areas while keeping the wood wet with a damp sponge. The non-drawn areas will absor absorb water and reject the ink just like traditional lithography, or that it's what the theory is, unfortunately. Litho pencil was not the best choice of drawing materials for the Mokalito process. I learned this after the fact. And it, because the Mokalito process is far less stable and predictable than traditional lithography. So the first print on proofing paper was perfect, but the first print on good paper filled in quite a bit and then every print after that kept getting lighter and less detailed. At this point, I thought my first mocolito was a failure. So I decided to add color with Mylar stencils and very transparent ink printing in relief. This is on proofing paper. This is what it looked like on top of my mocolito. This is the second run with very transparent ink. Then I added leaves the same way with another run through the press. And here it is printed on top of the mocolito. And then I added the hand up at the top. And that was the next run. And then I forgot to, um, I forgot to photograph the next run, but it was a second run that I put on the hand and then these, uh, I added these leaf shapes. So I skipped one run, but this is the finished print. And I named it Manzoko, Japanese for contentment. And it's an edition of three, Kitakata paper, 21 by 17 inches. And it was purchased for the new Ronald McDonald House last fall. 
Then I decided to print my Mokalito matrix again in a transparent white and got two very different monoprints. This one, Manzuku 2, received the second place cash award in Hot Chow 6 at Studios on Sheridan last fall. And Manzuko 3, monoprint, the darker version, was selected for the Monotype Guild of New England's exhibition press and release in New Hampshire last year. And it's currently part of the spring exhibition of the AmeriColor Print Society, the Abington Art Center in Pennsylvania, that can be viewed online if you go to their website. So this is the Mokalito block of wood after it was printed twice and a little wood was cut away. So the first time I cut it in a dark green, almost black, and the second time in a transparent white. And this print is part of a three-person show. I have nine prints in this show at the Quad City uh, Airport. And the show has been extended through June. Uh, um, I don't think anybody wants to be in an airport right now, but they tell me there's 12 flights a day, so maybe somebody will get to see it. For my second Mokalito, I decided I would start with a uh, background color first and put the Mokalito on last or on top. So this was the first run through the press using a Mylar stencil. And here's the second run. And this is actually the Mylar stencil on the wood. This is an open an area that I'm inking up and another area here that I'm inking up. Because they're isolated shapes, I can print them together in one run. This is what they look on the wood, like on the wood after I remove the Mylar stencil, and this is what they look like on the paper. Now this area I had to print in two runs and I neglected to photograph it for some reason, uh, but it was printed the same way in two runs. Then I printed the Mokalito on top in a transparent white etching ink. And unfortunately, some of my drawn lines in magic marker did not show up. So I was kind of disappointed. I didn't really like it at this date. So I decided, well, I'll print it again in blue. And here's the Mokalito. Uh, printing matrix after it's been printed in blue, inked up in blue, and then this is the finished print, which I like much better. And this is called an ascent. And now I'd like to talk about what I've been working on since I've been staying at home with the rest of you. <laughs> uh, sheltering in place, this is my stay at home print. I started with the same block of wood that I used in the second Mokalito because I didn't cut any wood, I could reuse it. So what you're seeing is uh, the patina from the stained uh, wood from the previous print and I did a drawing right on top. First run through the press with a Mylar stencil. Second run through the press with the Mylar stencil looked like this on the paper. Here's the ink for the third run, blended roll. Before I rolled it out, here's what it looks like when I rolled it out. And I was able to reuse the same stencil. Usually I only get to use them once, but this time, because the stencil didn't tear and the shapes are isolated, I was able to print uh, these two shapes with the same stencil and that's what it looks like on the paper and I think we're up to the fourth run now and two hand brayers two blended rolls this is what it looks like on the wood this is what it looks like on the paper and for the fifth I think we're on the fifth run uh, here's the ink and the blended roll and this is what it looks like on the wood transferred to the paper. I was really thrilled when I got to this stage of the print. I just knew 
things are going to work out. And at this stage, I pretty much decided that I didn't want to print a mocolito on top. The original goal was this is going to be all background color for another mocolito. But um, I sort of fell in love with my background colors and didn't want to cover them up. It was snowing in mid-April when I printed the sixth run. And um, here's what it looks like on the paper. And the last run through the press and the finished print. Printed on a Monday, posted it on Facebook on a Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I had sold two prints to two different women named Jan, both living in different parts of Arizona. So that's the first time that's ever happened to me that I sold two prints before the ink was even dry and before I'd even come up with a title for the print. So I gave my stay at home print the title Anima Mundi, which means soul of the world. And now I'd like to talk about the Immigration Project, which is a project of the Los Angeles Printmakers Society, which I'm a member of. And it, this was a collaboration of 70 artists. And it was held, the first venue was the Southern Graphic International Conference at the University of North Texas, Denton. And here it is in the Texas Gallery. And this is my contribution right here. I'll show it to you larger. So two different artists did these two rectangle or triangles and the bottom two triangles are mine. We were each asked to come up with a triangular print uh, that uh, spoke to the theme of immigration and migration. And from there, it went to Venice, Italy, to the Scuola Internazionale de Grafico in Venice last October. And now it's a collaboration of 145 artists. And this is the diamond shape that I ended up in. And here's my two contributions. And here's an even bigger close up. And this immigration project was conceived and organized by Mary Sherwood Brock, a wonderful Los Angeles printmaker. I can't give her enough credit. This was just, I was just so proud to be invited to participate in this. And here is a description of the project that happened in Venice. And then it went to Los Angeles in the beginning of this year, January through February. And now in addition to the 145 artists that participated in Venice, artists were asked to make uh, origami boats out of prints. So what you see here hanging from the ceiling are all these origami boats made from different types of prints. And here's my two original contributions here. And here is my origami boat. Now, I totally failed the origami instructions. <laughs> and so the first time I got to see it as a real three-dimensional print was on Facebook in this photo that Mary Sherwood Brock posted. So I was very happy to be part of this project. So a big thank you for your time and interest. You can see more of my work on my website. Just remember to spell my name, my mother's spelling, C and I E. And now I guess we open it up for questions. Yep, so if anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and just make sure that um, you get Kathy's attention. I know we do have uh, two comments. Um, Erica said that she loved the title of one of your pieces, and uh, Lori says, very nice. So, no one else has questions. I have a couple for you. Okay. Okay. Shoot. <laughs> so, um, what's your primary inspiration? I saw a bunch of different from pictures, 
and from stories, but what's the source of like, either content or nature that you find yourself drawn to the most? Well, water has been a recurring theme since graduate school. I always go back to water. <laughs> uh, I started out very abstract uh, in graduate school with abstractions of the landscape and water type imagery. And then through the 90s, I started getting more figurative uh, and worked very often from my own photographs. And more recently, I've come full circle. More recently, I've gone back to non-objective work with whispers of landscape. And usually there's some kind of water in there too. <laughs> That's good. My other question is, um, what drew you to printmaking as a medium in the first place? Well, I fell in love with printmaking when I took my first printmaking class at Ohio State University. I was a painting major before that, but I was hooked right as soon as I took my first printmaking class. And I did lithography for 15 years and loved that and didn't want to do anything else and went to graduate school to become a better lithographer and rediscovered the woods cut instead and then I've stuck with that for 35 years and so the mocha lito process is getting me back into lithography and I'm just thrilled with the idea of getting the drawn quality of lithography the drawn and painterly qualities of lithography into my woodcut prints all right well that's all of my questions if anyone else um, would like to ask theirs the floor i've got a question can you hear me yes okay kathy i've got a question you mentioned a story uh i think it involved a saudi prince you said there was a story but you didn't have time to tell it do you have time to tell it now? <laughs> uh yes um basically i was part of a group show in Jeddah uh called reflections of france and I think there were seven of us and we had all been to France. We had one bona fide uh, real uh, Frenchman in the show and the rest of us had just been to France. And uh, it was, the gallery was above this uh, uh, famous China and glassware shop. I mean, a very big name. I can't think of the name of it, but you would recognize this very high-end China glassware uh, brand, if I could think of the name of it. And uh, the owner was a German woman married to a Saudi man, and uh, the artist had to more or less man the gallery, because, you know, it was basically a China shop downstairs. And so the Saudi husband came upstairs to just check on us, see how we were doing. And the artists are standing around and we had absolutely no uh, viewers, you know, it was just the artists. Nobody, you know, no, no people came at all <laughs> that, that night. <laughs> and so I jokingly said to the uh, owner's husband, the Saudi, uh, why don't you just go out on the street and, and stop traffic and drag some prints in here? Would you, you know, just drag somebody in here? Because we haven't had anybody all night. And not like five minutes later, in walks a Saudi prince with, with his bodyguard. Wow. <laughs> and he was so charming. He spoke to each of the artists and uh, was just, so charming to each of us. And he spoke uh, German to the woman who spoke German and he spoke uh, English to me. And I think he also spoke French to somebody. He was multilingual and he was just Prince Charming. And <laughs> so uh, things start very light, late in Jeddah, uh, you know, so it was like, past my husband's bedtime because he was obviously working and had to get up early by the time I got home from this gallery stint and he was already in bed and I had to wake him up to tell him I had met, uh, met Prince Charming and oh, 
and then the prince bought my art on the spot. You know, he said, I'll take that one, that one, and that one. And wow. uh, it was pretty amazing. And so anyway, my half asleep husband just croaked like a frog. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. 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 My life there was just one fairy tale after another. It was pretty extraordinary. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, that's a cool experience. Well, I love watching. I loved watching today and learning about your process. That was really cool. Thanks for taking the time to share that with us. Could I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, you mentioned uh, Japan and the Japanese prints, obviously, as uh, one of your inspirations. I can't recall whether you've been to uh, Japan, whether uh, there were other uh, more contemporary print makers uh, of the 60s and, and on uh, who have inspired you. And uh, if you could share some of the experiences if you've been to Japan, and particularly sure. Kyoto. <laughs> Well, I have uh, been to Japan twice. Once while I was living in Jeddah, I got to uh, do my first uh, trip to Japan and saw Kyoto and Tokyo and two or three other smaller uh, little towns. And then on my second trip to Japan, I went to visit some very good friends that we met in Grenoble. They were Americans, but they were expats with us in Grenoble, France, and we became very close. And then their next assignment, I was so jealous, they got to live in Japan. <laughs> I would have loved to have gone from France to Japan, but I wasn't that lucky. I had to come back to Peoria. <laughs> uh, so I visited them for a couple weeks and traveled around Japan. Uh, a second time. Uh, my more contemporary influences, I love the woodcuts of Helen Frankenthaler. Uh, I know Karen Kunz personally. Uh, we lived in Columbus, Ohio and met in the printmaking uh, lab at Ohio State University. Uh, I love her work and she has definitely in inspired me, although we, it's funny, we were both doing lithography back in the 70s when we met, and now we're both specializing in woodcuts, but uh, she's a fabulous printmaker. Um, oh, I just have too many influences to name, but uh, I do love the work of Helen Frankenthal, especially her woodcuts. Thank you so much both for your uh, wonderful presentation and uh, for sharing it with us. Uh, and uh, we did see at the Biennale uh, in September a wonderful video and a lot of work of Frankenthaler. Well, so, uh, yes, and I can see the uh, connection that you share with her. And then obviously also the uh, wonderful Koi. <laughs> uh, and, They're my uh, pets, I love them. <laughs> yes. So, dam origato. <laughs> I believe Curtis had a question, and then I'll go back. I'll go to you, Ted. Okay. Uh, it seems like that in the course of the woodcut printmaking process, you have a number of surprises, um, things that you didn't expect were going to happen. And um, you alluded to this a few times in your presentation. I wonder how many times do you have a, a absolute failure, something that you just did not want to proceed with or to uh, show publicly? Well, really there was only one edition that I totally abandoned during my whole career since graduate school and that became a series of monoprints after my paper maker died <laughs> because I never throw anything away. So <laughs> uh, I did eventually make it work. Uh, but yeah, I, that was a commission piece that just didn't work out at all. And um, I mean, I printed the, the original edition sometime in the 90s and then it just sat in my print drawers 
And then after my paper maker died and my paper was too precious to print on, I started making mono prints out of this edition I didn't like. Uh, but printmaking is a very creative process and um, surprises always happen. And uh, sometimes things turn out better than you planned and sometimes they don't. <laughs> Success story. Thank you very much. Kathy, I've got a question for you. Oh, it's Ted Johnson. Uh, Hi, Ted. Hey, how are you doing today? Uh, I enjoyed your trip to Mexico, too. I kind of followed you a little bit on Facebook. Hey, uh, got a question because I like to keep my knives sharp when I'm doing things. And your tools have got to be kept sharp, too. So do you hand sharpen all of your own chisels and everything? I'm terrible at that. I am just so bad about sharpening. Uh, I chew them up so bad and then they can't be sharpened and I end up sending them back to Japan to have them reworked. <laughs> okay. No, I'm not good at back keeping them sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do better. Okay, if that's all of our questions, uh, let's give a big kind of not loud round of applause for Kathy for sharing her process with us and for um, taking her time to, to give us this wonderful presentation. And Jan, I did see your comment. We are joined by one of the Jans who bought your print. Um, so thank you for spending some time. Uh, I'm sorry, do you have another question over there? For I, I, mean, it's, I just wanna say that it's such a delight to live with these prints that uh, this room is not one that uh, is in constant use, but it's visited several times a day just, just to be here and see them and, and enjoy it. So you, you frighten, frighten our lives. Well, I just love those two prints on that turquoise wall. I'm just <laughs> dying to paint something turquoise myself. It just, <laughs> they really glow on that wall. They look great. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you. We'll be having another virtual art club uh, next month and I hope to see you all there. <laughs>